Hello, my name is Al Tanju. I'm the VP of Referees for the Georgia Soccer Officials Association, and I'd like to welcome you into the 2020-2021 season with new rule changes for the National Federation. Today's agenda will cover both rule changes as well as points of emphasis from the National Federation. To start us off, Rule 2 has been modified to address the change in the drop ball for when a ball becomes deflated. If the ball becomes deflated during play, it will be put into play with a drop ball to a player of the team last in possession at the spot where it was last played. Additionally, if the ball becomes deflated during a penalty kick, the kick will be retaken. Rule 4 has had two modifications. The first, players are no longer required to tuck in jerseys. I'm sure both players and officials are excited about this one. This is to acknowledge that manufacturers are not making jerseys anymore that are designed to be tucked in. And clear and completely white mouth protectors are now legal. Rule 9 has been updated to address what happens when the ball touches the referee. It acknowledges that a team should not gain an advantage when the ball touches the referee and stays on the field, field of play, including when it goes to an opponent as shown on the left, or goes into the goal, or starts a promising attack. The restart will be with a drop ball to a player of the team last in possession at the spot where it was last touched by a player, an outside agent, or in this case, potentially the match official. This is an example. Under the new rule, play will stop, play will be restarted with a drop ball to the blue player. Rule nine is also updated to what happens when simultaneous touching occurs. That's where two opponents simultaneously play the ball and it goes out of bounds. The restart will be a drop ball five yards inside the boundary line to one player of the team in possession of the ball prior to simultaneously touching. So if you look at the picture to the left, the white player plays the ball. Then simultaneously, a white and black player play the ball and it goes out of bounds. The restart in this situation will be a drop ball to the white team five yards inside the boundary line. If simultaneous touching was to occur within the goal area, then the restart would be a drop ball to the goalkeeper. And that leads into how do we administer a drop ball? A drop ball goes to one player of the team that last possessed the ball. The ball is dropped or it was last touched by a player, an outside agent, or match official, unless the ball was in the penalty area or the last touch by either team was in the penalty area, in which case the ball would be dropped to the goalkeeper. If the ball was in the penalty area or the last touch by either team was in the penalty area, when play was stopped, the ball is dropped to the defending team's goalkeeper. All opposing players must be outside the penalty area and all players must be at least four yards from the ball, as demonstrated in the picture to the left. Additionally, if the ball was in the goal area when play was stopped, it is dropped to the goalkeeper on the goal area line, which is closest to the location of where the ball was when play was stopped. Moving on to rule 13, it has been updated for ceremonial free kicks when three or more defending team players form a wall. All attacking team players must remain at least one yard from the wall until the ball is in play. A penalty for players that fell to move the required distance has also been updated to include the defensive wall when three or more defenders are in the wall. It's up to us as referees to proactively manage both the wall and the attacking players. And we need to remember the spirit of why this rule was changed. And that was to reduce the conflict between attacking players trying to interfere with the defensive wall. This should be a tool for us and should 
infrequently result in a caution to an attacking player. Rule 13 was also updated for a free kick is taken within a team's own penalty area. The ball is now in play when it is kicked and moves. It no longer has to leave the penalty area to be in play. Rule 13 was also updated to emphasize that the referee must show and hold the indirect kick signal until the kick is taken and the ball is touched by another player. Failure of the referee to correctly signal indirect free kick when the ball goes directly into the opponent's goal results in a re-kick. Us as referees should not allow this to happen. We should not be retaking free kicks because we did not show and hold the indirect free kick signal until it was touched by another player. Moving on to Rule 14. Rule 14 was updated, updated for the goalkeeper. The goalkeeper must stand with at least one foot on or in line with the goal line, shall not be touching the goal post, crossbar, or nets until the ball is kicked. Side to side or forward movement is allowed. However, the keeper may not leave the goal line with both feet until the ball is kicked and moves. This is an example of a properly taken penalty kick. Change to the penalty kick, rule 14. The opposing goalkeeper shall stand with at least one foot on or in line with the goal line, facing the kicker, between the goal posts, and shall not be touching the goal posts, crossbar, or nets until the ball is kicked. Lateral or forward movement is allowed, but the goalkeeper is not permitted to come off the line with both feet until the ball is in play. Lastly, there have been several modifications to Rule 16, the goal kick. Players opposing the kicker shall remain outside the penalty area until the ball is in play. Once the ball is spotted on the ground and within the goal area for a goal kick, the ball is in play when it has been kicked and moves. After the goal kick is properly taken, the ball may be played by any player except the one who executes the goal kick. What this means is if an attacking player is still in the penalty area where the team takes the goal kick, that player may play the ball once that ball is kicked and moves. It also means us as referees need to be aware of the tactics that are being taken by both the team taking the goal kick and the team opposing the goal kick it may require us to adjust our positioning in order to see what happens in those situations. Be aware of those tactics. Next, we'll address three points of emphasis from the National Federation. The first point of emphasis deals with the field and uniform consistency. It's our responsibility to arrive at the venue with enough time to inspect the field and player uniforms. We're to communicate issues to the game day administrator and or coaches as appropriate so that those issues may be corrected. For issues that were unable to be addressed, submit a match report through the GSOA website, and we'll communicate those to the school administrators or GHSA as appropriate. Second, there's an emphasis on reckless and serious foul play. We need to focus on understanding the difference between fair, hard play, and a foul that is either reckless or serious foul play. National Federation is encouraging us to take opportunities to educate ourselves on reckless and serious foul play. We'll be posting a training video on misconducts. They also encourage us to focus on preventative officiating. And that starts with the pregame meeting. As part of the pregame meeting, we're to address fair play and good sportsmanship with both the coaches and captains letting them know the expectations for a competitive and fair play. We're also empowered to talk to players and captains during the match, particularly where the intensity of play increases and fouls become more prevalent. Remind the players what's acceptable, manage them. We also have tools such as verbally warning players, how and when we use our whistle, and penalizing reckless and serious foul play with the appropriate card when necessary. This all culminates in communication. What we allow or do not address, we encourage. 
We should address reckless and serious foul play immediately and communicate to players and coaches that that level of play will not be tolerated. Third, National Federation likes to remind us that high school athletics is education-based and some of the mechanics of our game are intentionally different from other levels of soccer. One of those being the pregame meeting. The purpose of the pregame meeting is to communicate expectations to coaches and captains to have a purposeful start to an education-based match. These topics include COVID-19 considerations. Remember, we are responsible for communicating them, not enforcing them. Sportsmanship, permanent rules. These are usually key rule changes that may have an impact on the match. Confirming the coaches have verified that players are properly and legally equipped. And of course, the coin toss. There will also be a pregame meeting and COVID-19 considerations training video for an example pregame meeting. If you have any questions or comments, email altonju at al.tonju at gsoa.net. Questions will be collected and responded to collectively prior to the beginning of the season. Copies of rule changes will be made available on the GSOA portal.